Good afternoon, everyone. I think it's my pleasure to have you all here. Uh, the Kent Distinguished Lecture are sponsored through the vision of Paul F. Kent Memorial Fund, which was established in 1977 to support education in transportation engineering. The Paul Fraser Kent Distinguished Lecture was initiated in 2007 honors outstanding leadership in the field of transportation engineering. Paul Kent was a 1920 graduate of the University of Illinois in the Civil Engineering Department. As a highway contractor and material supplier, he owned and operated two champagne-based companies, which is General Paving and Builder Supply. Throughout his professional career, he expressed the highest regard and great esteem for the education in civil engineering, especially at the University of Illinois. He dedicated himself to civic service in Illinois and surrounding states. He was the founder and president of the University of Illinois Civil Engineering Alumni Association, which is now the largest in the country in civil engineering, and was the, and was the recipient of the University of Illinois Loyalty Award and the Civil Engineering Distinguished Alumnus Award. And today we are very, very pleased to have a very distinguished speaker with us and a good friend of many of ours here. Uh, Dr. Schwartz. Chuck Schwartz received his BS, Master's, and PhD from MIT, all in civil engineering. He is currently a professor in civil engineering, as well as the chairman of the Department of Civil Engineering at the University of Maryland at College Park, where he teaches courses related to pavements design, analysis, advanced soil mechanics, and computational geomechanics. His research, interest, and experience span the areas of analytical and numerical modeling techniques for pavement structures and characterization laboratory testing of pavement materials. He has played leadership roles in many national research projects sponsored by the government, federal government, state governments, as well as local government and the industry. He has been serving on several national boards for international journals in his field. He's very well known. I don't think that we need to uh, give him more than that or talk more about this. I think we are very, very pleased to have him with us today as our Kent Distinguished Lecturer. Chuck. Okay. Thank you. I'm not, I'm not sure I recognize the guy in that uh, in the introduction there, but thank you. <laughs> uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here at the University of Illinois. Um, I always enjoy my visits to campus here, and I'm, I'm pleased to see that. Uh, Things at Illinois are pretty much the same as they are at the University of Maryland in that nobody sits in the front row. Yeah. <laughs> um, so today I'm going to talk about uh, some work, uh, some uh, several related projects uh, that we've been uh, working on over the past several years on uh, structural characteristics and environmental benefits of cold recycled asphalt paving materials. And these are asphalt stabilized um, uh, cold recycled materials. So, um, we're going to try to cover a lot of uh, ground here, um, uh, so I may skip over some of the slides pretty quickly. Uh, first, I want to talk about the structural characteristics of asphalt-stabilized, cold-recycled pavement materials, because this was largely, uh, this is largely unknown, uh, what, especially in the context of, of modern um, mechanistic empirical pavement design, we just don't really know what the properties of these are. And so we started with an initial case study we did for the Maryland State Highway Administration on one class of materials and then have been generalizing that through a national study under the National Cooperative Higher Research Program. I'll talk about both of those. And then more recently we've been working on uh, investigating the environmental benefits of these, and in particular the greenhouse gas savings that a company uh, uh, recycling and in particular in-place recycling. And this work is actually funded by uh, local industry, global resource recyclers, who um, their end, object end objective here is to try to be able to generate revenue streams from trading of carbon tax credits uh, from the emissions savings. So, um, so for the first project, we were focused on foam-stabilized materials, which are an interesting class of materials that are somewhere in between asphalt and, and unbound materials. Uh, it's a cold process. The aggregates are cold and they're wet. And what we do is we take uh, hot bitumen and inject water into it. It creates a foam, and we spray it on the, on the, on the aggregates. And what it does is it, is it coats the fine aggregates, and then the, the asphalt-coated fine aggregates um, under compaction bond together the larger aggregate particles in the mixture. And the aggregates can be anything. Uh, very commonly they're recycled asphalt pavements, but they can be recycled concrete, they can be virgin aggregates, um, uh, and 
And so generally we're looking at adding about 2% uh, binder uh, in these foam stabilized materials. And this can be done uh, two ways. It can be done uh, using a cold central plant recycling system as shown in the lower left. Uh, and these, these central plants actually are mobile. Uh, you can take them to the job site or you can keep them parked at your, your production facility. Uh, and we're also looking at cold in-place recycling or uh, full depth reclamation. And again, the, the, the applications are, if we're looking at, at CIR and, and CCPR, we're really looking at, at milling off just part of the asphalt layer, recycling it, putting it back down, and then putting uh, a hot mix uh, surface course on top of it. Uh, for full depth reclamation, we're going deeper into the granular base and even some, in some cases to the subgrade. But again, uh, stabilizing it, putting it back down, compacting it, and then putting a surface layer of HMA on top of it. Uh, the mix design for these materials are, uh, is, is uh, fairly crude, and in fact some agencies don't even go through a formal mix design process for these materials, but the, the most commonly accepted mix design process is in terms of indirect tensile strength. So you make essentially you know, martial size pucks and you do an indirect tension strength test on it, and there's usually a, a specification for a minimum wet tensile strength and a maximum tensile strength ratio. Um, there's also some requirements on the foaming characteristics of the binder that you need to satisfy. But basically, the, the key thing here is that the mix design is based on strength, which, again, for pavement design is not really the thing we're interested in. Okay, For a well-designed pavement, we should not be near the failure limit of these materials. We're interested in stiffness, uh, not strength so much. So we had the opportunity to test these materials on a, a lane addition project on Maryland 295, just outside of Baltimore, Washington International Airport. So it's you know it's a high volume road, uh, not a lot of truck traffic, but uh, but some. And we had, without going into the details, we had um, uh, three segments of three different segments of foam stabilized base material, and a couple of uh, graded aggregate base sections that we could use for controls. And then there was a control strip that was paved early in the project to get compaction patterns uh, down. And this particular mixture that we were looking at here was a little bit unusual in that um, uh, more, more commonly uh, these foam stabilized materials or foam asphalt stabilized materials would be 100% wrap. In this particular case, this supplier used 60% uh, re uh, recycled concrete and 40% wrap and a 2.8% foamed asphalt. And you can see a little bit of the details here on the, on the gradation characteristics and uh, some of the mixture design characteristics. And again, on that last line, if you look, um, the foam stabilized material is being placed at a fairly high moisture content because it's, it's compacted, you know, essentially using Proctor compaction theory. You run Proctor compaction tests on this material, figure out the optimum uh, moisture content and compact it at that, at, at that level. So on this particular test, we were interested in doing um, uh, field stiffness evaluations of this material. And so uh, um, on this, you know, so again, there was a control strip and, and two uh, production segments that were placed in the summer of 2011. And we had uh, several things that we were testing here. We did standard nuclear density gauge testing, which is a little bit tricky on these materials because, with, because of the bitumen content, uh, the water content reading from the nuclear gauge is, is thrown off, and so you've got to do a correction for that. Uh, we had a geo gauge for measuring stiffness. We had uh, actually several LWDs, but the one we used the most is, is the Zorn LWD, lightweight deflectometer. And then also we had uh, the State Highway Administration come in and do some conventional FWD testing. So one of the things we were interested in was to see um, so how the properties of these materials change with time. There's a curing process that goes on in the field with these stabilized materials. We put them down and they get progressively stiffer over time, and we wanted to track that in this case study. And, and, and that's exactly what we measured. If we go in, and, and again, those of you who have worked with these in-situ stiffness devices know that they all give different values and they don't always agree with each other. And we found that here, that the stiffness we got out of the Zorn LWD was different than what we got out of the GeoGauge, and it was different still from the Dynatest LWD. But you can see the trends here. The red lines are the, the, the foam stabilized base. And so we get about roughly, what is that, about a, a tripling of the stiffness uh, in the first week of, um, of curing. And again, this is uncovered at this point. We just we placed this material, compacted it, and it's just there in the sun. Um, we also had a stiffening of the granular base. Okay, and you can see that is the light blue curves, and that, that roughly doubled in stiffness. Um, and that's simply due to drying. 
Okay, if you look at it just from a partially saturated soil mechanics perspective, now if I'm placing this material at you know 8% moisture content, whatever, it's, it's July uh, in Maryland, it dries out, and so I get I develop matrix suctions, and so that's an, an increase in the effect of confining stress, and we see um, an increase in stiffness just because of that. And so some of the increase we see in the foam stabilized base material is also due to drying, and so one of the things we wanted to try to do was to separate out those two effects. And so we did this in a, in a fairly straightforward way. We took the empirical uh, unsaturated soil mechanics models from the, the MEPDG and used that to try to estimate uh, what uh, increase in stiffness we could expect to see uh, as a consequence of changes in saturation level. That's all. And, and um, it actually turned out to work. Uh, and there were actually two versions of this. There's the, the, the upper equation is the one that's in the, the MEPDG model, and then Claudia Zapata and her students at Arizona State had come up with an enhanced model that included some density effects and other things. And so we looked at both of those. And okay, so this is the, the, the uh, similar to what I had before. So this is, is um, uh, increase in stiffness is measured by the, the LWD. So you can see the raw data over on the, on the left. Um, and then on the right is plotted essentially the, the ratio, this, this, this F sub U, it's the ratio of the moisture adjusted modulus to the modulus under optimum moisture conditions. Um, and so you can see that uh, the material was placed at optimum moisture and density and the, the, the foam stabilized base increased by about a factor of three. Um, you can see how much the granular material increased and those bars over on the far right are telling us um, how much um, the, uh, what, what the increase in stiffness would be just due to the drying effects. And you can see that the, 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 the granular base actually agrees quite nicely with this, that the, the increase in stiffness that I'm seeing there agrees pretty nicely with what the empirical unsaturated soil mechanics model would predict due to drying at that point. Now, it also looks like the, um, uh, the foam stabilized base material is uh, influenced, or is also mostly drying if you look at this. But there's another effect that's going on here that we had to correct for, which is that uh, we're testing on a granular base layer that's only about eight inches thick, and the zone of influence for the LWD goes below that. Okay, and so the readings that we're getting from the LWD are, are a combination of the stiffness of the granular base and the subgrade stiffness. Now, that has more of an effect for the foam stabilized base material because that is a stiffer material. And, and, and the softer subgrade underneath has more of an influence. The granular base had a stiffness closer to the subgrade, getting closer to homogeneous conditions. And so when you go in and correct for the, the finite layer thickness, um, you can see that, um, uh, I don't have a good pointer here, but um, uh, so we've got, oh, this isn't gonna work. I'm gonna take the mouse over there. All right, well, I have to, oh, there it is. Okay, so this is, this, these were the measured values, and this is after making the adjustment for the influence of the, uh, of the uh, uh, soft subgrade underneath. And again, the effect was, was most pronounced for the, the granular base layer, uh, for the foam stabilized base layer, not so much for the granular base layer. And so when you make that correction and go over here and look at, uh, at this curve, now we can see that, in fact, there is a lot more going on than just drying the foam stabilized base material, that after I make that, adjustment for the finite layer thickness, I'm getting about an eight-fold increase in stiffness in that first week uh, for that, for the material in that layer. Oh, great. Thank you. Oh, excellent. Okay. Um, yeah. yeah, I'm going to put it on the lab there, Mike. So I'll just, I'll just stay, stay put. <laughs> Thanks. Um, uh, okay, now, okay, so this is after, this is just seven weeks, or seven days, rather, after placement. Um, and then we pull off the job and um, uh, stop taking readings. Now, just before opening for traffic, this, it opened for traffic about, uh, about six months after uh, placement. Uh, we went back and did FWD drops on the material and, and saw what had happened. And uh, oh, I still need to put this on. Um, and and, and uh, so we came back and, and did the back calculation analysis and uh, some interesting results. Okay, so we get sort of reasonable modulus values for the for the um, uh, for the surface layer, 
a uh, little bit lower on top of the GAB because that was a little bit stiffer than these other sections which had the, the stiffer, this was a little softer than the other sections which had the stiffer base layer and so I'm compacting against a softer layer, I'm, getting, I'm not getting the same amount of compaction as I am on the other sections. You can see the subgrades coming in pretty uniformly all along. And the thing here that we're interested in is the base layer. Okay, and there's a fair amount of variability. But you can see that you know what's happened here is we've we've got an enormous increase in stiffness now six months out. If I back up, okay, so after seven days we were up at uh, what about 450 megapascals for stiffness, and now we're, oh great different units. Uh, so but this is about a seven 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 fold higher um, stiffness at six months than it was at um, at seven days. You know so something really has been going on here. If I look at the seven-day stiffness, the, the coal central plant recycled material after seven days, the stiffnesses were all down in that region. So in that intervening six months, four to six months, depending on which section I'm looking at, uh, we had a, an enormous gain in stiffness due to field curing of this material. Um, and, um, and, and again, you know, th this, this was um, not, not terribly surprising to us because others had found this in the literature. Uh, Andreas Loisos in Greece had, had uh, looked at a foam stabilized uh, uh, project and did falling weight drops uh, over time after construction. And I, there's a lot of scatter here. I tried to fit in the mean trend here with, with the red. And you can see also that a big increase in stiffness, you know, most of it taking place in about the first six months after placement. Okay, so, so our results sort of match that. And, um, uh, but, you know, the, the clear thing here is that if we want to get a good estimate of the structural characteristics of these materials, we really have to do it in the field cured condition. That, you know, immediately after placement is no good. Uh, doing it on laboratory prepared specimens doesn't work because it's, it's virtually impossible to reproduce this field curing phenomenon in the laboratory. So we really have to go in and try to do it from field cured uh, samples, which is what we did. We decided we're going to do some, some structural property testing. so we you know, ran some tests through our, our UTM 100 and um, uh, uh, at State Highways run some through their uh, AMPT device. And the, the properties of interest here are, are the ones that we're interested in primarily for mechanistic empirical pavement design. So we're interested in stiffness, which means dynamic modulus. Um, and again, here we're going to be looking at axial for the moment. But in the general case, if I'm looking at in-place recycled materials, we've got some considerations here about specimen size that generally if I'm doing cold in place recycling, I don't have a tall enough specimen to do an axial specimen and I might have to do IDT, dynamic modulus. Um, but we're interested in getting the master curve and the temperature shift relationships for these materials. And we're interested in permanent deformation characteristics. Right? What, are the, what are the slope and the intercept of the secondary <laughs> stage so I can predict running in these materials? Um, and we had, I'm sort of skipping over some of the details here, but um, there was some debate going on about, you know, so what's the best way to characterize these materials? Do you characterize them as unbond materials or do you characterize them as, as asphalt materials? And our judgment in the end was that the temperature effects and the loading rate effects were sufficiently strong in these materials that they really should be treated like asphaltic materials. Um, Maryland has not transitioned completely to the MEPDG. I don't know, very few states have transitioned completely, so they were also interested in what the properties were for the 93 Ashto empirical design method. So that means trying to back out uh, a layer coefficient for these materials, which is going to be a function of the, of the stiffness. And so we, we tried to do that also. Um, but again, so what we did is we went in, you know, just before opening for traffic and, and took cores uh, roughly six months after construction took them back to the laboratory. I should mention here that the, the pavement section on this was uh, eight inches of foam stabilized base material placed in two lifts. Uh, well, it wasn't consistently two lifts, but eight inches of, of foam stabilized base material. And then on top of that, eight inches of hot mix. Um, and I think part of what's going on in the field curing is that when you put that, that hot mix on top of it, you, you know, a lot of the heat flows out through the bottom of the mat and that's flowing into the stabilized material. And I think that's doing the final cooking of this stuff that, that really solidifies the bonds. But the point is, when we tried to core this a couple of weeks, you know, a month after construction, you couldn't get cores out. The, the foam material would just crumble. When we went in six months 
and took core out, we got this 16 inch long core that if I didn't know that it was foam stabilized material on the bottom, I'd have said, somebody put down 16 inches of hot mix, it looked that good at, at that point. And so we went and we ran, you know, dynamic modulus, and you know, there's some recycled material, there's a fair amount of variability, um, and, uh, uh, you know, I gave a little, I'm trying to give a little bit of an indication here uh, up on the top of some of the variability. One of the things we were interested in is, uh, so how did the stiffness of these recycled materials compare with, with hot mix asphalt? And that's shown on the lower left where the black dot dashed line is, is sort of, a, you know, we took, took a tip of a mix and, and plotted the master curve for it. And you can see that, you know, uh, in the middle to, um, uh, you know, middle to upper, upper shelf regions of the master curve that the cold recycled material is coming in at about half the stiffness of hot mix asphalt. Um, Uh, we, we also looked at, uh, there we, are. Uh, we also looked at repeated load permanent deformation behavior, and again, you know, a fair amount of scatter, but one of our interests here was to look at how this compared with the same behavior for hot mix asphalt, and so the solid lines, I'm sorry, the, um, uh, the solid and the dashed lines all correspond to the foam stabilized material. The two curves at the top that go into tertiary flow are for some, from some laboratory prepared specimens uh, that just failed prematurely. And again, that's in part because it's so difficult to replicate the field curing conditions under laboratory um, curing. Um, the, the dotted lines um, are what we had for, again, some typical hot mix uh, mixtures that we had tested in the past. And, and the takeaway from this is that in broad terms, the repeated load permanent deformation behavior of these foam stabilized this foam stabilized material was comparable to what you'd have for hot mix, okay, and that's okay because these materials are generally going to be lower in the pavement structure. They're not going to be right at the surface. Most of the rutting in the asphalt layers are going to occur in the upper few inches of, of the of the pavement section, and so. Um, we've got reasonably decent repeated load permanent deformation characteristics here for a material that's going to be deeper in the pavement section. Rutting should not be a problem. Okay, and then to, uh, uh, to make um, uh, uh, our sponsor happy, we tried to back out what a layer coefficient was. And again, here's another philosophical discussion. Okay, when we're talking about layer coefficients, is this an A1 or an A2? Is this, is this an asphalt layer or is it a base layer? Uh, we went back and forth on that. Uh, if you go into Vertkin's uh, chart from their design manual with the, the mixture properties we had, you, you would back out something uh, of a layer coefficient of about 0.28. Uh, we went a little bit farther we, since we had stiffness measurements both from laboratory assessment and from FWD drops. We, started, we tried to plot those up and we looked at all of the various relationships that are available in the 93 Asheville Guide for getting at layer coefficients. And we looked at it as an asphalt material, we looked at it as unbound material, we looked at it as, a, as an asphalt stabilized material. We sort of looked at all of those relationships and plotted them all up and, um, uh, and then you know, sort of eyeballed it and, um, and made a judgment. And so on this graph here you can see the scatter and the data in the boxes so show sort of the mean and you know, standard deviation ranges. For all of that data and so you know we sort of hung out on the wall for a while and stared at it and then at the end of the day said well okay i think that maybe um uh values like this are about right so in terms of layer coefficients you know if i've got something that that just meets the spec of a of a uh indirect tension strength of 40 psi which is over on the right then we get a layer coefficient of something on the order of 0.3 to 0.32 we also looked at 100 percent wrap material or tried to estimate for 100 percent wrap material uh, if I've got something that exceeds the specs a little bit, and I've got a 50 psi uh, wet indirect tension strength, then we're somewhere up at 0.35, 0.36. And again, if you look at like a base asphalt mixture, um, what would you use? What does what Illinois use as a layer coefficient for a base asphalt mixture? 0.4, something like that. Um, so you know, this is sort of like a, a low quality asphalt base mixture is, is what our judgment was at the end. And so in, in the end, we came up with some recommendations uh, to the State Highway Administration that uh, for specifications that, you know, they should base it on a minimum of 45 PSI soaked ITS and TSR, maximum TSR of 70%. And that corresponded to a resilient modulus or, uh, of around 350 KSI and a layer coefficient of about 0.32.
and um, they were happy with that, and, and you know, been designing sections using that now. But this was sort of a, this was sort of an introduction um, um, to me, at any rate, uh, in these materials. And as it so happened, at the same time, I was I was uh, talking with and working with Brian Diefenderfer from the Virginia DOT, who was in the midst of doing a big reconstruction project on I-81, which is one of the major truck routes through the uh, uh, Shenandoah Valley. And they were doing a combination of cold central plant recycling, cold in-place recycling, and full depth reclamation. And he was finding exactly the same things, that when they went in, you know, they could, they could measure an stiff, initial stiffness increase when they went in four to six months later and did FWD drops, they saw, you know, a whopping increase in the stiffness. Um, and, uh, you know, so it's consistent trends. Uh, and they seem to be real because the, the section that they rehabbed of I-81 was something that it, it, it's a terrible subgrade. They would have to go in every two or three years and do major maintenance and rehabilitation to it. This thing has now been in service for about four or five years and, and looks, looks very good. So the material has been holding up. So, but as a consequence of that, um, uh, Brian and I teamed together to um, uh, pursue the NCHRP 951 project which was um, intended to determine the, the structural properties of these materials for use in mechanistic empirical pavement design. So we're looking at, at again, asphalt stabilized, cold in place recycling, and full depth reclamation. And so our focus here was on, on the in situ structural properties, again, under field cured conditions, because these are going to be the relevant ones for the pavement service life and to develop the material property inputs that we need for the uh, pavement ME design program, so that means dynamic modulus and repeated load permanent deformation characteristics. Um, and again, the repeated load permanent deformation characteristics go into the distress models for predicting rutting. And so again, many of you have seen the pavement ME design software, but basically we're looking for the numbers that go into these inputs, input screens in the software. And so the basic premise that we proposed, and the, the panel seemed to go for it, was that um, it, it, it only made sense to measure these things on field cured, for field cure conditions. So we were going to have to go out and get cores six, you know, at least six months after construction and measure the properties on those. And then our hope was that those after the fact field cured structural properties could be correlated back to mixed design properties and, and field conditions during placement um, so that in, in the design stage we could have some sort of predictive model that would tell us what kind of properties we'd have in the field cured condition. And this, this was kind of an unusual team, I think, for, for NCHRP projects. Uh, you know, many of uh, my faculty colleagues here have you know, pursued and successfully and sometimes unsuccessfully NCHRP projects and forming the right team is often, um, you know, the, the, one of the biggest challenges and, and the biggest opportunities. And this one was unusual because, you know, so here, you know, I was at the University of Maryland, a conventional, you know, university-based researcher. Then we had Brian Diefenderfer at the Virginia Center for Transportation Innovation and Research. So it's an agency. You know, it's, a, it's an operating, this is the research arm of the Virginia DOT. And then we had two industrial partners, uh, Virgin America uh, and Coloss Solutions. And, and their role was to help us identify projects. Since they were providing the technical support to agencies that were actually building these projects, they could identify suitable projects so we could go to the agency. And they could, they could provide the entree to the agency so we could try to persuade the agencies to go back the following construction season and core these uh, roads for us for testing. And um, we're, we're still in the middle of this, okay? So th this is a work in progress where we've got some, some results that are at least worth looking at right now. We're, we're actually in the analysis stage right now where we finished all the field sampling and the laboratory testing. Um, uh, and in the, in the end, we got 25 projects in 13 different locations, a little bit fewer than we had expected, but the the severe winter in, um, not 2014, 2015, but 2013, 2014, depleted agency budgets because they had extra snow removal costs and the construction season started very late that year. And so they weren't able to provide us with as many projects as we had hoped on that second season of the project. Trump, so, yeah. What's the Illinois project? Uh, no problem. Yeah, I'd have to go back and check the data. It may be around this area, if I remember correctly. Uh, Stephanie Drain, I think, helped us get 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 samples for that. Um, now, one of the pro one of the 
one of the project, one of the problems we, we knew we were going to encounter here, particularly for CIR, is that the lift thicknesses are just not great enough to do conventional laboratory testing. You know, we're looking at at most six inches for a CIR layer and, and typically less than that. And so the question was, how are we going to measure dynamic modulus and repeated load permanent deformation uh, characteristics for, for these thin lifts? And originally we thought, well, we could do it using indirect tension testing. Richard Kim at North Carolina State has worked out a, a way of doing that. We tried it, didn't seem to work very well for these materials, and so we, we decided to go a different way. And we decided to capitalize on some work that Nelson Gibson at Federal Highways had started on looking at, at, at sub, substandard size cylinders and doing testing on those. And, um, and so we thought, well, this is worth pursuing. And, and what we would do in that case is we would pour horizontally, okay, because we could, we could get a two inch diameter uh, specimen if we, if we cored, uh, if these are six inch cores, so I could get a two inch diameter by roughly six inch long uh, cylinder out of it if I cored horizontally. Um, and we wanted to see if we measured those kinds of specimens, if we would get the same results as we would with full size specimens. Now, since we had a limited supply of the recycled material, we did our preliminary study on hot mixed asphalt, uh, and we looked at a couple of diameters and a couple of heights and a bunch of mixtures. Brian kind of went a little over the top on this. Um, but we, we got a good set of data, and we were comparing small scale versus full size. And this just shows the setup, you know, a special coring jig where you could go sideways through the cores. Um, and you can see it over there, you know, the, the, the cord specimens on the, on the bottom left. And then on the AMT, AMPT uh, jig for attaching the instrumentation points, you know, Brian had to do a little bit of machining to, to adjust the arms so that they would reach in on these smaller diameter specimens, but that was a fairly straightforward operation. And so at the end of the day, uh, when, you, when you plot up the data, it looks pretty good. Okay, so we've got the small scale specimen, dynamic modulus values along the vertical axis, the full size, you know, conventional cylinders uh, along the horizontal axis, and, and yeah, there's some scatter, but I'd say that that certainly, uh, cert my view is that, yeah, there may be some errors in this, but since we don't have a clue as to what the, the dynamic modulus properties are for these cold recycled materials, I'm willing to tolerate, you know, a 10% error. That, that's okay. Um, so we said, this is good enough, we're going to go this way. And so then we started coring the, uh, the recycled materials, um, and doing the testing. And, um, uh, you know, if you plot up all the master curves, you know, they look sort of like this. Um, and not a whole lot of pattern that we've been able to distinguish out of this so far. Now, this is not the most, most useful way of comparing all of these data. And so what we did is we said, well, let's, let's identify some key dynamic modulus values out of the temperature and moisture combinations that we, or uh, frequency combinations that we looked at. Let's choose something, let's choose the one that's closest to the upper shelf, one that's closest to the lower shelf, and one sort of in the middle, and use those as fingerprints for the, for the dynamic modulus master curve. And so, uh, and so we plotted those up, and here you can see things now segregated out by, by the mixture type. So we had FDR emulsions, okay, so the, I, I skipped over that, but the first project I talked about was just foam stabilized materials. The NCHRP 951 included both emulsion and foam stabilized materials. So we had some FDR emulsion projects, foam projects, uh, cold in place recycling emulsion and foam, and we had some cold central plant recycling emulsion and foam projects. And, and here you can see the, the three different dynamic modulus fingerprint points on here. And the interesting thing here is that if you look at this, you know, there is surprisingly little difference among these different types of materials. About the only consistent trend that you can see here is that the the cold central plant projects on the far right tend to come in a little bit stiffer than the in-place recycling projects. And, and that sort of makes sense. You've got more quality control over the cold central plant recycling. Some of the producers actually try to fractionate, try to sieve their, their aggregates a little bit, their, their wrap a little bit before making it. So I've got better quality control and so that shows up here as better stiffness. The real, the real key here though again is, so all right, that's fine, but how does this compare with, with conventional hot mix mixes? And uh, so here we've got some typical HMA values, and these, you know, unfortunately I don't have, a, didn't have a lot of data for base mixtures, which would be the, the better comparison because we're using these really toward the base of the asphalt layer. Uh, I mostly had data for surface mixtures, which are going to be stiffer, but if I go in here at um, uh, four degrees, uh, 40 degrees, I'm sorry, this is, um, yeah, 40 degrees C, uh, one hertz, the, the, the lower shelf value, uh, 
you know, the middle point. Yeah, right, okay. So, so here are the, the sort of ranges of the hot mix asphalt dynamic modulus values at those same temperature and loading rate combinations. And again, there's some scatter. We had something on the order of 20 mixtures we looked at. Uh, so we've got a range of values here. And if you look at this, you know, look at this long enough, you know, you come away with the conclusion that, you know, as we saw in the first project, that roughly these, these recycled materials, these cold recycled materials are coming in with stiffnesses roughly half of what we have for hot mix asphalt. Okay, so um, um, is that good or is that bad? Well, that's one of the things we're in the process of, of analyzing now uh, in, in the analysis stage. Um, you know, the, you know, the, one question would be, so what's the impact of that going to be on uh, performance of the pavement as predicted by the MEPDG? And that's what we're looking at. Uh, but roughly, again, the takeaway is that these materials, not a lot of variation among the different types of materials, uh, and coming in at roughly half of hot mix asphalt. Um, here are the repeated load permanent deformation curves. Um, uh, and I've forgotten what the story is with that orange one, but something screwy went on in testing that. And again, these are all measured from field cured cores, the small, small cylinders also. Uh, and so we went in again with some key uh, repeated load permanent deformation parameters to try to sort this out a little bit. So we looked at the slope and the intercept of the secondary stage. And we also looked at the accumulated plastic strains at 1,000 cycles, which is roughly the beginning of the secondary stage, and at 10,000 cycles at the end of the test. And, um, and, and, and here's how the data shake out. And again, you know, the CIR projects tended to show a little bit higher susceptibility, well, not tended, they did show a higher susceptibility uh, to rutting. If you look at the microstrains of 1,000 cycles and, and 10,000 cycles, the coal central plant uh, materials and the FDR materials all came in sort of roughly at the same um, uh, values. And again, if I try to superimpose typical HMA values for, super, for surface mixes, uh, I get things that sort of look like this. Um, and I can see that, well, okay, for the FDR and for the CCPR materials, it looks like we're sort of in the same ballpark as we have for hot mix asphalt. Our CIR is a little bit more problematic, um, but again, these materials are going to be deeper in the pavement structure. And, and so even though they're more rut susceptible, it's not at all clear that that's going to translate to increased, you know, significant increase in surface rutting. Now, okay, so where we're at right now is trying to develop these correlations. And frankly, it's, it's not been easy going right now because, as, as, as you've seen, there, there's not been a lot to distinguish the properties of these different kinds of materials. I mean, there's quite a bit of a difference between you know, an emulsion FDR project and a, and a foam cold central plant recycled project for next year. But we're attempting to do the correlations um, uh, and again trying to relate the mixed design, the things we know in advance, the mixed design properties, what were the conditions at, during field placement, you know, was there field QA done, was density taken, you know, what are those properties, and we're hoping to correlate those with the actual structural properties that we're interested in, the dynamic modulus and the repeated load permanent deformation. And again, measured from the field cured cores, the sort of after the fact structural properties, and then uh, looking at that in terms of performance modeling and predictions. And so, you know, the, the correlation analysis, just to give you a flavor for it, so for the inputs, we've got a lot of things. We've got gradation, we've got, you know, how much stabilizer we've got. In a lot of these mixtures, we will throw in a little bit of uh, Portland cement as an additive. Um, you know, if it's a foam project, what were the tensile strength values? If it was an emulsion, what's the stability? values, um, and then, you know, construction was the recycling depth, bulk density after compaction, you know, curing time, how long has it been sitting there, what was the overlay thickness, and then the outputs we're looking at, what we're sort of fishing right now, we're looking at, uh, you know, at dynamic modulus at these key sort of uh, fingerprint points, you know, different temperatures and, and, and loading rates, uh, we're also correlating things with the uh, master curve parameters. Um, and for repeated load permanent deformation behavior, again, the, the plastic strain at 1,000 or 10,000 cycles, but more importantly, the uh, secondary permanent deformation parameters, the slope and the intercept. Uh, flow number, not so much. None of these materials really went into flow for the conditions we tested. And we tested using the NCHRP 930A recommendations for hot mix asphalt. Um, and, um, uh, and again, flow number is really just a screening parameter anyway. It doesn't tell us a whole lot about predictive performance. 
And then, you know, we want to use the results from the correlation analysis then to actually develop a model that will allow us to predict what the structural properties are based on these input values and, and you know, sort of leaning toward these artificial neural networks, which we apply very successfully, we and others have applied very successfully to a whole lot of these kinds of predictive models. But that's where we're at right now. We're trying to, to sort all of that out. <clears throat> but <clears throat> as things stand right now, again, you know, we were able to successfully measure these structural properties from these small cylinder um, specimens, which again, you know, for if you're looking at, at overlays, even for hot mix overlays, this is this suggests this is the way to go to get those structural properties. Uh, we went and actually measured the properties from these 25 mixtures at 13 locations. And as I said, you know, the modulus values are about 50% of those of hot mix asphalt, a little bit lower for um, CIR, uh, and the repeated load deformation behavior similar to HMA except again for the cold in place recycling which tends to be a little bit more rut receptive rut susceptible. So the CIR is, is sort of the outlier. It's a little bit less stiff and a little bit more rut susceptible than the other classes of material. Um, and again what we're what we're doing right now is the correlation analyses and the neural network modeling and and then the, 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 the last analysis work is looking at sensitivity studies to see, okay, if, if I use these, these cold in-place recycling or cold recycled materials in place of other rehabilitation strategies, what's the impact on performance? Which is really the, the thing we're interested in at the end of the day. Okay. Take a deep breath. Shift gears. Um, that was all on structural properties. Now, um, the the thing we've been working on more recently is looking at the greenhouse gas emissions. And this is a project that, again, is, is being funded by one of our local producers. I was, I was sort of involved in helping get the project going and, and connecting up the right players. And we've got somebody on the faculty who is actually much better than I am on the sustainability stuff who has taken the ball and run, run with it. But what we've been doing is a, a complete cradle to placement uh, greenhouse gas um, analysis for these processes. We're looking at conventional hot mix asphalt pavements, cold central plant recycling, and cold in place recycling. And again, it includes everything. It includes the, the, the embodied carbon in the raw materials going in, into the mixture. It's including all of the emissions from the production process for the materials. Uh, it's including the emissions from all the transport of materials, both you know into the plant and then transporting the the produced materials out and includes all the emissions from the, the construction processes in placing this material. Um, and, and, th and this just shows the, um, um, you know, sort of the major steps in it. We've got, um, uh, so, you know, here's, here's all the, the raw materials going in, so it's all the embodied carbon in those. And then we've got the, 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 the production process here, uh, you know, including everything, even the emissions from heating the, the plant office uh, goes into this. And then the transport to the to the, the job site, and then the whole laydown process, and all the emissions for that, and uh, and so that would, that last picture would apply to both hot mix asphalt and for cold central plant recycling, uh, for the the cold in place uh, recycling production and placement. Uh, there, you know, basically the raw materials are on the ground, well, most of them. I mean, we bring in bitumen, and we may be bringing the dry additive and water. But uh, there's much less import of new materials and there's much less transport since we're essentially milling up the material, stabilizing it, putting it right back down there so we don't have a lot of trucks running back and forth and that's a big savings uh, in emissions. And so this is the thing that's a little bit different with the cold in place recycling process. And, um, uh, and one of the things we wanted to look at is that not just the emissions um, embodied in the materials, not the emissions per ton of materials would be suggested by those last flow charts, but also recognizing that the, the recycled materials aren't quite the same as hot mix in terms of structural performance, and so we have to make an adjustment for that. If I'm going to use four inches of hot mix asphalt, I might have to use six inches of CIR to get the same structural capacity. And so we needed to, uh, to do an, uh, an apples to apples comparison. We wanted to design pavement sections for each of these conditions that had the same performance. And, um, and so uh, we had a baseline scenario, which is the hot mix asphalt. Um, and uh, you know, so we, we designed a, a section for that. And then we looked at um, the foam stabilized base or a foam, sta foam, foam sta stabilized bitumen pavement. Yeah, um, and, 
and so here, we, and so we're looking here at either coal central plant recycling or coal in place recycling. Um, uh, my colleagues who did this also threw in a, uh, a Portland cement concrete pavement section, and um, but the data we have on the emissions for that isn't isn't quite the same as, as what we have for the asphalt materials. I'll, I'll throw it in, but I'm going to focus on the asphalt system. Um, now, you need a lot of data to do these emissions analyses, and, and a lot of it is available in standard databases scattered all around the literature, and, and we dug up all of this stuff, and there's, there's um, uh, you know, databases for uh, the embodied uh, carbon emissions in, in materials and for transport and, and all sorts of uh, processes like that. There's, you can get uh, information on emissions for equipment usage for different categories of emission. Uh, you know, the coal central plant is run by electricity, so, you know, there's emissions associated with that. And so there's a bunch of standard databases that we looked at uh, to get at these um, uh, and methodologies that are out there to do it. And in, in the end, what we're looking at are, are all these different emissions categories that we're all going to add up uh, at the end of the day. Now, to supplement that, um, we also sent teams around to various sites around the, around mostly the East Coast, some in California, to actually collect real project data. They would go out and they would log everything that was going on at the site, what equipment was being used, for how long, and so on, and brought it all back and did, um, and did the actual emissions calculations for those uh, specific projects, uh, rather than just using the generic database um, information. And, you know, and, and there's a, a, a fair amount of variation, but this is showing um, you know, some of the computed emissions, uh, so that we looked at, uh, for HMA, we looked at 10 projects, 16 producers, um, and, um, uh, okay, uh, so that's the upper left, and then sort of in the middle is the CIR, we had five projects, uh, and for the CCPR, um, we just had uh, one producer, the funder of the research, but 13 projects for that. Uh, so we collected all that information, and again, this is information for real projects, you know, the real equipment usage, the real material usage that went into it. Um, and uh, again, we also pulled out, um, uh, let me see what's happening here, it's none of these Mac to Windows things here, that's where the fonts are screwed up. Uh, the, uh, we also got sort of standard information for, uh, you know, PCC pavements, um, and um, and again, you know, including, we'll include it here for a comparison. But the, um, uh, you know, the real thing here, so now just looking at the production and placement of the material, not, not making the adjustment for the fact that these materials have different structural capacities, uh, you can see how this shakes out. So the hot mix asphalt came out with about uh, 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 250 kilograms of CO2 equivalent per, per metric ton of material. CCPR comes in at about half of that, at 75. Cold in place recycling, uh, you know, at roughly, uh, what is that? That's, um, you know, 20% uh, of the hot mix asphalt. Uh, the PCC comes out with the highest emissions, but again, you know, the, the, the calculations on that one are a little bit shakier. Um, and again, that's mostly from the production of the cement that goes into it. So then we went and we looked at a case study. Okay, we want to say, okay, now if you were going to use these pro these 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 products in a real pavement, and, and now had to account for the fact that they have different structural capacities, um, how how would things shake out? And so we took um, the intercounty connector, which was a major uh, recent construction project in Maryland. Uh, we took a, a 7.2 mile length of it. Um, uh, it was com completed in the late uh, 2000s. And uh, the original design, you know, which is a straight HMA flexible pavement, conventional flexible pavement, was uh, um, you know two four-inch lifts of 19 millimeter super paved mix with a, a surface course of two inches of nine and a half millimeter, and all that over a 12-inch CO6 stone base. So that was our, our baseline uh, pavement design, and then we designed. So we analyzed that using the mechanistic empirical pavement design guide and found out what the predicted performance was, and then we went in with a uh, a cold central plant recycled rehabilitation scenario and designed the pavement section so it would have the same predicted distresses at the end of its design life. We did the same thing for a CIR uh, section. Uh, so now we're actually comparing things in a fair way that, that we've adjusted for the differences in structural capacity. 
And so when you go in there and look at this, the, so the, the units are a little different here. Now we're doing it per, uh, per mile, per lane mile. So again, the HMA here, you can see it's broken out by, you know, what are the emissions associated with the surface mix, the, 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 the base asphalt mix and the granular, um, uh, uh, granular aggregate base. Um, so our HMA comes in at about 550 metric tons of CO2 equivalent per mile. Uh, the CCPR material comes in at about uh, 400, so roughly about 25% lower than the HMA. Uh, and the CIR comes in at roughly about half the emissions of, uh, of the HMA. Uh, and again, just for comparison, there's the Portland cement concrete over on the far, far right. Um, so um, this, you know, this is fairly significant. This is... Uh, um, You know, I, I can see a time in the not too distant future when, when states and agencies are going to start mandating stricter sustainability requirements that could include limits on greenhouse gas emissions for projects. And this kind of information is going to feed right into those kinds of uh, scenarios. Um, so anyway, to conclude, uh, so again, looking at the structural characteristics of these cold recycled materials, Again, in, in broad terms, a little bit, you know, less than, or sort of less than a base asphalt mixture, sort of called a very low quality base HMA mixture. Again, a structural layer coefficient of around, you know, 0.32 seems to be a reasonable number. Stiffness about half that of HMA. Repeated low permanent deformation behavior comparable uh, to HMA surface mixes. And again, you know, the CCPR seems to be slightly better than CIR and FDR, and again, I think it's because of the better quality control we have in, in the, the central plant produced material. And we really didn't see much systematic difference between emulsion and foam uh, in any of these, okay? And so, and, and the way this is, is, is evolved is some states do all emulsion stabilized materials and some do all foam. And, you know, I think it's largely, you know, it depends on who got there first. Did Birkin get there first or Colas or, you know, whatever. And then it becomes kind of a religion that, well, we've always done foam, we've always done emulsion. Uh, but from our results, we just don't really see much difference uh, in terms of the structural performance of these materials. Again, I think a key finding was that, um, uh, and again, Nelson Gibson had done some of the preliminary work on this, but we really, you know, banged on this one pretty hard and came away you know, with the conclusion that these small-scale specimens actually do a pretty good job of giving us uh, uh, good test, test results, good estimates of the structural properties. And then again, the final bit of this is the greenhouse gas emissions, you know, substantially lower than for HMA and PCC. And as we saw just on the last slide, for the coal central plant recycling for the case study we looked at, uh, it was about a 26% savings for the CIR, 53% savings versus HMA. And again, that's including the differences in the structural characteristics of these materials, as well as the differences in the production and placement processes. And right now, we're about halfway through this very laborious process to get formal certification of these greenhouse gas emissions savings. Um, there are several uh, NGOs that do this. The one we're dealing with is one called the Verified Carbon Standard. And again, it's a, this multi-cycle review process that um, is about halfway there. Um, but again, the idea is that um, uh, even now and certainly in the future, you know, there will be a trading market for these carbon credits. Uh, and so these are the potential revenue stream <coughs> producers. And with that, I can open it up for questions. on this answer. I think it was running, was the controlling uh, distress. Do you use the Bobby Litton's thing? Yes, yeah, the one that's in there, so that's the one we're using, yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, but again, you know, we're using the same one for, for all, all, all the scenarios, so if it's wrong, it's wrong, hopefully the same way for all of them. <laughs> Just to follow up on that question, how were the thickness of that when you switched from HMA to CIR to 
Um, again, I'd have to go. Uh, I wasn't involved in the details of that part of it, but, but really no, 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 no. I mean, you, you can get an idea from just looking at the layer coefficients that you know four inches of if you you know four inches of HMA is sort of equivalent to six inches of CIR, that sort of thing. You know, it wasn't huge differences in, in, in thicknesses. I mean, again, these these cold recycled materials are pretty competent materials. You know, they're not they're not HMA, but but they're a whole lot better than than aggregate base. So. Yeah, is the assumption in the MVPG that these are bonded, and then the, or is there no fatigue calculation for the? Uh, they were modeled as though they were asphalt layers because we were putting in as the inputs the dynamic modulus values. So, so the fatigue performance function is assuming it's a hot mix asphalt. Yeah, the, the fatigue the fatigue relationship probably isn't valid for these. But and, and so. When I say that, yeah, they failed in running, I suppose you could come back and say, well, they may have failed in fatigue if we had used the right fatigue. The, but to take that a little bit further, I mean, the, the question came up early on, even in the proposal in the work plan, about, you know, do we need to consider fatigue for these materials? And um, uh, probably for CIR, not so much, because there's often some remaining asphalt underneath the CIR layer. Um, and so these, these things aren't at the bottom of the asphalt layer. Uh, for FDR, you know, maybe arguably more so. Uh, the South Africans and the Latin Americans have done some work where they looked at, at, at fatigue damage and it really is a function of stress ratio. And, and so if you get a, a stress to strength ratio greater than about 0.6, that's when you start seeing damage accumulating. If you're less than that, you know, it's kind of like shakedown theory. If you're less than that, you're, you're okay, you don't really see much degradation of the material. This is an issue for the South Africans and they've seen some fatigue problems because they tend to use these materials with very thin surface forces. In U.S. practice, you know, we'd be putting down a couple of inches of hot mix on top of these things, you know, for, for most of these sections. And so for that kind of a, of a scenario, you don't get the very high stress ratios. And anecdotally, um, there haven't been any reports of fatigue problems with any of the projects in the U.S. with these materials. Yeah, Chuck, when, uh, what kind of emulsion was used here in the, the CIR, and how long it took in some of the projects to cover it up with the overlay, and how this influenced your results. It, it, it was all over the place. I mean, there are different, many different kinds of emulsions and, yeah. and different construction sequences, and, and we've got all that information for the individual projects, and we just, you know, we haven't seen any consistent trend on it. Uh, but again, all of that stuff, uh, eventually it breaks, you know, eventually it starts to cure, and then come in six months later and take a core. Um, so my question is, after maybe three, four months, whatever, mm -hmm. the period, are they all the same? They're not all the same, but if you ask me, could I, could I, you know, predict which one's going to be better versus the other, I mean, I think the inherent variability in these recycle processes is swamping any of the causal relationships. At least we, well, we're in the process of trying to find the causal relationships, and it's been pretty slow going so far. Yeah. So. Yeah. Are you going to be recommending some mix design tests at this design phase, or just going to be using models based on gradations, emulsion percentage? Yeah. No. The 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 the, the, the whole work is predicated on the assumption that um, it will be recommending you know structural material characteristics for the material on based on the assumption that. The mixes have been designed and constructed following best practices, and, and we'll we'll itemize what, what those are. Uh, but yeah, I mean, in, in all of these mixtures that we're looking at, we're all sort of designed using and placed using best practices. You know, these were all projects that Virkin and Colos were engaged in, and, um, and and so yeah, if somebody does a really lousy job on the mix design or doesn't get compaction in the field, yeah, then then our results that we found here probably aren't going to apply. Were any of these projects in Iowa where they don't do mixed designs? Uh, nowhere in Iowa, but New York State doesn't do mixed designs either. But but what, what we did with New York State is we got some of their loose material and we did the mixed design tests on, on the material so we knew what the tensile strengths were. And, and so. uh, yeah. Yeah. New, York, New York State does a lot of this and they, did, they don't do mixed designs. I don't understand it. So. <laughs> Now, this is really interesting because, uh, I mean, 
in other words, doing now the life cycle yeah. assessment. So yeah. this is really complementing what we're doing. Yeah, yeah, so I mean, it's very much along the same lines. So we need yeah. to take you for a dinner so we can get this in from <laughs> There were some engineered emulsions in there too. Um, yeah, just that answer straight stuff too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and again, I, I, I don't think I, I don't think I have the database with me, but we can pull all that stuff up. So that's what I was interested in. Is yeah. to See what the polymer yeah. has any impact. Yeah. yeah. Would you expect the maintenance uh, intervals to be the same? I'm worried about your life cycle assessment because you're kind of just treating the front end of this. Not that it's wrong, but but if your maintenance cycles are closer together, then your local greenhouse gas emissions aren't so favorable. Yeah, well, that that that's a that's a valid point, and you know I think that the answer to that is unknowable at present. That um, not, not, enough experience. not enough experience. I mean, some of these projects have been out there for a long enough time, uh, but people haven't gone back and, and I think really looked at that data. Uh, carefully. I mean. Again, certainly anecdotally, um, I mean, I was been putting these things in for a long time, uh, and uh, anecdotally, nobody's coming back saying, "Oh, yeah, th this stuff works okay, but you got to go in three years earlier to do a, 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 an overlay." So um, there's no evidence of that. So, yeah, question. And just our question about the uh, green gas emissions uh, collected from different states. Was there any variation comparing different states? Um, no, and you know, I don't know if our data set was large enough to, to really um, do that. Um, uh, um, I, th I think that um, this was this was uh, more in, in an effort to to give us better confidence that the kind of standard numbers we were getting out of the conventional databases. Um, well, there's two purposes for it. One was to get some confidence that those numbers are, are correct, and also the, the verified carbon standard as part of their certification process wanted to see some real data. So we went out and collected some real data for it. Yes? So uh, on, the, like, on the process of CIR or CTR, mm -hmm. uh, you said that the Is what's been used, and and again, it's, it's, it, I just think of it more as an index 
property that you know you've got some target you want it's like flow number you got some target hit flow number doesn't actually mean anything but you got a minimum value you got to you got to you know hit some yeah um, okay uh, so my question was on the base layer which you use uh, as CIR so you you model that in the NPDG as a stabilized layer so that it wouldn't be able to talk about suction or um, or uh, moisture ingress into it that is uh, right strong. Yeah. But do you think there would be any reason to believe there would be problems with suction or, say, with uh, drainage because of using that as a base layer? Now, when you say base layer, what do you mean base layer? Do you mean like a, a drainable base layer or a base asphalt layer? Well, your, your modeling said it would be a base asphalt layer. Base asphalt right? layer, it's, yeah. But that's a philosophical reason. Yeah. It's somewhere in between. Yeah, it's not, it's not. We actually measured. Um, uh, the permeability of this material, I, I don't have a lot of confidence in the numbers, but the permeability of this material actually was sort of within the same ballpark as for the, the aggregate base. But again, Maryland spec for aggregate base is not very good, but they let in way too much fines, and so our permeabilities are pretty low. Um, but in the context of the, of the MEPDG, uh, I had an out on that one, because since the MEPDG doesn't model drainage anyway, you know, <laughs> it, 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 you know, it, it, um, uh, it's not an issue for the MEPDG. Uh, hopefully that, that, that will be a big deficiency that will be corrected at some point in the future. I'm going to take the last question yeah, from Just Errol. a comment, actually, on the, if you look at the technical guideline document from South Africa, uh, okay, the sophisticated level, they're really tracks it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that's where the stiffness is. They, they go into that to some extent when they want to do the sophisticated level. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the South Africans really have a much more sophisticated approach toward this overall. But again, they need to because, I mean, they're putting just chip seals on top of this stuff. And so this is really the main structural element. It's right up there at the, at the surface of the pavement. Right. I think we have a reception outside. The, you have more questions. So please join me to thank uh, Chuck again. Thank you. Thank you.